everybody and welcome to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we're working on this BMW 5 Series and the customer complaint is it has got no speedometer and it has got a transmission failsafe program and what I'm trying to do right now is to confirm the customer complaint and I will show you in a sec. Now that we confirmed our customer complaint, we can continue our diagnosis. Confirming your customer complaint is a very important step in any diagnostic process. Because if you didn't confirm the complaint, it's very hard to confirm the fix. Now let's start out by reading some fault codes. Let's go to drive. And since we had a transmission failsafe program, let's read the codes in the transmission first. And we have got a no com. Let's try again. And still a no com. Let's try, let's try the PCM, the engine electronics. And we have got a no com as well. So let's back out. Let's go to chassis and let's try the ABS and see if we can communicate with that. Now it's taking quite long, so I guess it's going to be a no com as well. Let's see. Yep, a no com. So let's back out and let's go to body. And since we had no speedometer, let's go to the instrument cluster. And we can communicate with the instrument cluster. So let's read fault codes. And we've got some CAN fault codes. Now what these codes are basically telling us is that the instrument cluster is getting no information from the transmission module or from the ABS module. Now we confirmed this because when we tried to read the codes inside the ABS module or the transmission module, we couldn't communicate with it either. Now why would the instrument cluster need any information from the transmission or from the ABS module? Now on the instrument cluster, is the little indicator which indicates in what gear you're at. Now that information is provided by the transmission module. And remember the speedometer that wasn't working, road speed information is provided to the network by the ABS module. From this point on you could take many directions. The direction I like to take is take one of the modules we can't communicate with and do the basic checks. Just check power and grounds and the communication lines and that way I hope to eliminate the problem and find out what is wrong. Now what module you should take depends on the car you're working on. Just take the one that is easiest accessible. On this particular car it's the ABS module. Now we decided to check the basics of one of the modules we can't communicate with. Again, on this car we've chosen for the ABS just because it's easy accessible on this particular model. Now this is the ABS unit and this is the wiring diagram. It has got three main feeds on pin 2, 6 and 23 coming from the fuses over here. It has got two main grounds on pin 1 and 5 and it's communicating by can high and can low on pin 40 and 24. 
Now, in order to do some measurements on this ABS unit, we need to back probe the pins. Now, to reach them, we've got to take this little plastic cover off. So let's disconnect the connector. There are little clips holding it down. And when it's out of the way, we can easily back probe the wires. Now this red wire on pin 2 is one of the wires we need to check. It's one of the three main feeds of this ABS module. Now in order to do the measurement, we need to back probe it. Now when you're back probing a wire, make sure you don't damage the weather seal surrounding the wire. Now in order to do this, place your needle as close to the wire as you can and gently follow it down all the way into the pin. This way, you make sure you don't pierce or damage the weather seal. Now let's start with the power in the grounds. I back probed the two uh, ground wires with these black back probes and I back probed the three main feeds with these colored ones. Now let's connect my test light to one of the negative wires and let's check the powers. One, two, and three. And let's try again using the other ground. One, two, and three. So the powers and the grounds on this unit are fine. And it's not the reason why I can't communicate with it. Now the power and grounds on this unit are fine. So those are not the reason we can't communicate with it. Now the next thing we're going to do is check the communication wires. Now in order to do this, we got to know what to expect. So before we're going to start the measurement, let me take you through the basics of CAN bus. Now let's ask ourselves the question, why CAN bus? And let me give you an example. This ABS module is connected to the wheel speed sensors. It uses the wheel speed sensors to calculate the road speed. Now there might be other modules also interested about knowing the road speed. For example, the transmission. It needs the road speed to calculate when to change gears. Now another module that might be interested in knowing the road speed is the instrument cluster. It needs the road speed to determine what to indicate on a speedometer. Now without CAN, all of these modules would need their own wheel speed sensor or they needed to be wired to the same sensor. Now using CAN, the information is put on a network by the ABS unit for all modules who would like to know. Dramatically decreasing the amount of wiring and simplifying the system. Now, not all the communication between modules in a car is CAN bus. You've got LIN bus, FlexRay, MOS bus, and you've got many more. And even when you're talking about CAN bus, there are differences. You've got low speed CAN bus, which is a one wire system, and we're not going to talk about it in this episode. You've got mid speed CAN bus, which is mostly used inside of the car for the comfort systems. And you've got the high-speed CAN bus, which is usually the powertrain CAN bus, which includes the engine, the transmission, and the ABS. Now, when you're working on CAN bus, you've got to know what CAN bus you're working on. So let's take a closer look to the differences between mid-speed and high-speed CAN bus. Now, let's select a mid-speed CAN bus and let's take a look at a known good. And as you can see, the voltage on a mid-speed CAN bus goes from 0 to 4, 4.3 volts, and the other line does the opposite. Now, 
let's take a look at the voltage on a high-speed CAN line. So let's select high-speed CAN line and let's take a look at a known good. Let's bring it down a little bit. Now a high-speed CAN bus goes from 2.5 volts to 3.5 volts and the other line is going from uh, 2.5 volts to 1.5 volt. So voltage wise both CAN buses are totally different. So looking at the voltage is telling you what CAN bus you're working on. I've made a simplified drawing of a CAN bus system. A CAN bus system uses a twisted pair of wires. But why are the wires twisted? Of course they are easier to recognize, but that is not the main reason why they have done it. They have twisted the wires so they are always close together. And when something would happen to the voltage in this wire, it's likely it will also happen in this wire. Like when an outside source is creating an induction voltage in this line, it will also create an induction voltage in this line. So if the signal voltage raises in this line, it will also raise in this line. But the difference in voltage between can high and low will still be the same and the system will still be operational. So it makes it more robust. Now I've also drawn two 120 ohm resistors at each end of the twisted pair of wires. Now in real life, these resistors are built within two of the modules connected to the network. Now it doesn't matter if you have two modules connected to the network, or in this case three, or even ten, there are always two with a 120 ohm resistor built into it. Now let me explain why these 120 ohm resistors are built into the network. Now to do that, you've got to imagine they are not there. Let's imagine both these resistors aren't there. We just have this twisted pair of wires. Now imagine a message being sent on this wire without the resistors. The message would travel to the end of the wire but at the end of the wire, there would still be energy left because there's almost no resistance within this copper wire. Now the message would come back because there's still energy left and it would go back and forth a couple of times until all the energy is lost. This is what we call an echo. Now we don't want any echoes on our communication lines and this is why the Resistors are built within the network. Now if a message has been sent, the rest of the energy that is left is consumed by these two 120 ohm resistors. Now that we know a little bit more about the basics of our CAN network, we can start doing some measurements on it. Now let's start by checking the resistance between both communication wires. Let's do it by using a simple ohms check. Now I've back probed the CAN high and the CAN low wire and we're going to perform a uh, resistance check using the multimeter. So let's put it on resistance on ohms. And let's check the resistance between CAN high and CAN low. and it's reading 59.7 ohms, so almost 60 ohms. Now I told you guys there are two 120 ohms resistors built within this network. So have we got a problem or is this a normal reading? Now we just did a basic resistance check between can high and can low and we measured a resistance of 60 ohms. Now is this a normal reading or is something wrong? Is this maybe causing the NOCOM? 
but actually the reading is just fine. When you've got two 120 ohm resistors placed parallel to each other, the total resistance is 60 ohms. Now if you're having a hard time understanding this, let me try to explain by a simple drawing. Now let's imagine we've got a river. And on one side of the river, people are waiting and pushing to get across to the other side. Now let's call the pushing of the people the voltage. And let's call the amount of people crossing the bridge in a certain amount of time the current. Now the bridge itself we're going to call a resistor. And in this case, I called the bridge 120 ohms. Now although the bridge is helping the people to get across to the other side of the river, it's also a resistance. It's the only place to cross the river and only one person at a time can cross it. Now would it help the people if we placed a similar bridge parallel or next to the bridge that's already there? Now let's try it. Let's draw the same bridge or <laughs> at least it is supposed to be. Well, let's also call it 120 ohms. Now, although we have placed another resistor, twice as many people can now cross the river. So instead of one person, now two persons at a time can cross the river. So, is the resistance now higher or lower? Well, our resistance has been cut in half. We've got twice the capacity. So, instead of 120 ohms, or twice 120 ohms, the total resistance, because twice as many people can cross the bridge, is only 60 ohms. Now that we've got that covered, and we know that our resistance of 60 ohms is just fine, let's bring out the oscilloscope and take a look at the waveforms on our signal wires. Now these yellow and black and yellow and brown twisted pair of wires are our high speed powertrain communication wires. Now I've back probed those, they are the same wires we did the resistance check on and I hooked up the oscilloscope so let's see what the waveform looks like. Now the ABS module is connected to the powertrain CAN bus. Now the powertrain CAN bus is a high speed CAN bus, so we're looking for the 2.5 to 3.5 volt signal on one wire and the 2.5 to 1.5 volt signal on the other wire. Now let's select high speed CAN bus and let's start the measurement. And I already preloaded a known good, so this is what the signal is supposed to look like. Now when I press play, it will display the waveform that's on our signal wires right now. Now you decide whether this is our problem, why we can't communicate, or whether everything is just fine. Now that waveform looked nothing like our known good. The voltages were way higher. So there's definitely a problem on our powertrain CAN bus. The next step is to figure out what's wrong. Now to do that, we've got to take a look at a wiring diagram of our powertrain CAN bus. This is the wiring diagram of our powertrain CAN bus. It has a yellow and black wire and a yellow and brown wire. Connected to our powertrain CAN bus is the engine, or PCM, the transmission control unit, the ABS module, the instrument cluster, and the steering angle sensor, but only if the car is equipped with DSC. Now the next test I would like to perform is called the unplug it test. If one of the modules on the network is responsible for disturbing the signals on the CAN wires, unplugging this module from the network should make the signals return to normal.
Now, since we're already back probed at the ABS module, and this one is the easiest accessible, let's start over there. Now, let's start the measurement. And let's start the unplug it test. Now, the first module I'm going to unplug is going to be the ABS module. So, let's unplug it. And it seems we got lucky. The first module we're disconnecting, the ABS module, is causing the problem. Now let's plug it back in. And let's unplug it again. Our ABS module is definitely causing our problems. We got very, very lucky. The first module we disconnected was causing our problems. Now, we don't get lucky every day, at least I don't, but it always seems to be the last one you're disconnecting or the one which is hardest to reach. Now, if you paid really close attention, you noticed that even with the ABS module disconnected, our signal voltage was slightly higher than our known good. So let's take another look at our recorded waveform. Now, as we take a closer look to the recorded waveform of our high-speed CAN bus with the ABS module disconnected, we can see that the voltage on CAN high and CAN low is slightly higher than our known good. Now, have we got another problem or can we explain this? There is actually quite an easy answer to the question why is the signal voltage a little bit higher with the ABS module disconnected? Now remember I told you that the resistance between can high and can low should be around 60 ohms, just like our meter is reading right now. I also told you somewhere in this network there are two 120 ohm resistors. Now let's see what happens when I disconnect the ABS module from the network. The resistance goes to 116.6 ohms. That's very close to the 120 ohms. That means that one of the two resistors is built within this ABS module. And without the ABS module connected, the system is running on only one resistor, causing the voltage to be a little bit higher. Now the next thing we need to do is replace that bad ABS module. ABS module has been replaced. Now let's bring out the scope and let's see if our communication has been restored. I've got the scope hooked up. The moment of truth. Now just let me know what you guys think about it. Have we got a fix?
We're inside the car. Now let's see if we can communicate with the powertrain CAN bus again. Now it looks like we're on speaking terms again, so that's great. And some CAN faults, but that was to be expected, not a big surprise. Let's try another module. Let's try the transmission. Yep, and communication is restored. Some CAN faults over there as well. No big deal. That was to be expected. It looks like we have a fix. We started this video by confirming the customer complaint. Now the customer complaint was a transmission failsafe program and no speedometer. We ended up with a CAN bus fault. Now because the network was down, the information about the road speed was no longer available for the instrument cluster and the transmission. So the transmission didn't know what to shift and the instrument cluster didn't know what to display on the speedometer. So at the end, it all makes sense. Now what I'm doing right now is confirming the fix. Are you curious? Now if you like this video and if you want to learn more, please subscribe to my channel. And when you hit the little bell, you will get a notification each time I post a new video. And remember, diagnose then, fix it again. See you next time, guys. Well, it seemed to be my lucky day, so I'm going home now, and who knows, I might get lucky again.